the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, which is a classic example of they should have known better. In fact, it's not that they should have known better. They, it's just to do with milking the cash cow that is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, the, I just came from this in the West End because they finally screened it at 4.20 last Friday, of course, which is no good because it's you know to do with being on air and all the rest of it. But usually a movie would be screened in advance for the critics. But this the print arrived very late, in inverted commas, so really we didn't get a chance to see it properly, so you have to pay to go and see it, which is absolutely fine. Don't mind paying to go and see it. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, early 1970s, classic horror movie, very little blood. One tiny pinprick of blood. The rest of it is also to do with suggestion. It is also to do with the atmosphere of horror, as famously demonstrated by the fact that James Furman, the then chief censor, attempted to cut the movie and discovered that no matter what he took out of it, it made absolutely no difference. And he banned it on three separate occasions because he could not cut the relentless air of terror out of the film. Now, that is a classic horror movie. Then spawned a sequel written and directed by the same guy who directed the first one and in a brilliant review by Kim Newman he said appears to have been directed by somebody who not only didn't make the Texas Chainsaw Massacre but didn't actually see it then there was the third one which was just like you know more of the same at one point it was going to be directed by the guy who, who made uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer then there was the fourth one which launched the careers of Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger and the story was that Renee Zellweger after she became famous became rather embarrassed about the fact that she was in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 4 despite the fact that Matthew McConaughey was quite pleased with it um, and then there was the remake with the Marcus Nispel rebate, which went back and did the original, but with just more leery violence and more sexist, gratuitous nonsense. And now there's the prequel to the remake. The only notable point of interest being that it has Arlie Ermey, who people will know from Full Metal Jacket and, passingly, from the remake of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's it in terms of backstory. So... There's the potential for doing the backstory of Leatherface, although actually the whole point of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was that these people didn't have any backstory. They were just a mad family. There was no logic, no reason, no rhyme. They just, you went out into the debt and there they were. And it was sheer, unadulterated terror with no explanation. But if you're going to do a prequel, maybe we can do some backstory about how Leatherface became No. The way this happens is he's born, 10 minutes later he picks up a chainsaw and then they're screaming crazy all the way through the film. Four teenagers turn up, they get chased around by a guy with a chainsaw, putting on flesh, a little bit of egg gain, and then it stops. It's uh, very... Sounds like an egg whisk. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's that unfortunately is what the that, chainsaw... That would be quite fun. Actually. What the Texas Being egg whisk by massacre. with an egg whisk. <laughs> There's a brilliant scene in... I can't remember what movie it is. I once wrote a piece about, about chainsaws in movies, uh, as one does. And there is a brilliant scene in one horror movie in which a guy attempts to back into a lift holding a running chainsaw behind him as he does it so that the security guard doesn't notice, notice that he's holding it. If, somebody, if anyone can remember what that is, I don't think it's Motel Hell, which is the one in which they have the chainsaw fight wearing the pig's heads. But it's a very, very funny scene. Anyway, the thing about the original, right, it didn't have any explanation, so you're already on bankrupt territory. The second thing about the original, it was not visually explicit. This is just visually explicit. It's like blood, gore, all over those, you know, splatter the screen because we haven't got anything else to do. The third thing about the original one was it was a milestone of horror because it did something that nobody had ever seen before. It was completely illogical. It was working from a legend that actually had been reworked by Hitchcock for Psycho because, of course, Ed Gein was the basis of the Psycho story. It did it in a way which no one had seen done before. It was what Furman called the pornography of terror. We are now on the sixth movie and there is nothing original about doing that. This is the past being regurgitated in the present with more flash, more blood, more effects, more money behind it, all the brain, all the wit, all the invention, all the excitement taken out of it. And let me make this absolutely clear. If you are going to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning, think, make a moral decision before you go in, okay? The first Texas Chainsaw Massacre had a strange kind of moral purity to it. John Carpenter famously said that after that film, he said he was watching that film went along the very edge of taste and he spent the entire movie in a state of sublime agitation. And he said, afterwards, I went home and slept like a baby. The difference with in this one, you start sleeping like a baby about 10 minutes in because the guy finds the chainsaw and the people start screaming, oh, fine, I know, I've been here before. You are going to do exactly the same rehash that you did with the remake and you're exactly the same rehash that you're probably going to do with Last House on the Left. If you go to see the movie because it has the name The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in it, bear this in mind, you are not being a fan. You are destroying the memory of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The people who have picked up this franchise, despite the fact that a vast amount of money is going to Toby Hooper, and bless him because Toby Hooper deserves to do well. Toby Hooper and Kim Hankel deserve everything that's coming to them, good for them. But this, and I know Hooper was, you know, theoretically involved in the original remake, this is just shameful. It's just a shameful, horrible, abominable, sadistic, stupid, dumb, 
become not very exciting and actually rather unpleasantly leery cash in on the legacy of the original. And here's the key thing for me. The original had nothing to do with sex. There was nothing leery about it in that, you know, in that very horror film way. You know, an awful lot of 1970s, early 80s slasher movies about, you know, pulchritudinous young women being chased around by blokes. By it was never about sex in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was, it was about... Killing ne- people. It was about nihilism. It was about coming face to face with this completely, you know... Un understandable monster. There was you just there was no logic to what Leatherface and his family were doing. Now it's just back to all the horrible I know what you did and he's in the house alone and don't answer the phone, blah de blah de blah. It's very loud, it's very noisy, it's very boring, and it has one good line in it. One good line in it. Now, here's what I can do. If you're not gonna see the movie, I'll tell you the good line. If you are gonna see the movie, block your ears for one minute, okay? We're ready. Somebody gets uh, Ali Omi um, cuts a limb off. And everyone screams. And then he cuts the other limb off. And somebody says, what did you do that for? And he says, balance. Boom, boom. Well, I thought of that halfway through when you were describing there you go. it. Well, there we go. And that's, believe me, that's the funniest line in the film. Something that I could have written. Yes, exactly. Yeah.